Alabama, Western Kentucky, and uh, the two of us are back. Time for the All-American Report. Roll tight, everybody. We're going to talk about Bama. We're also going to find out what Mike thinks about this matchup and uh, what all that stuff is behind him. I just want to know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm the only one, but I see a game ball back there, a trophy. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this. All right, there we go. Got the little open out of the way. And uh, now we can talk about some football. Uh, hey, coach, move to Wednesday. Is that it's it's a whole new era. And, and Coach DeBoer talked about why they wanted to practice early, Mike. He said that you get more out of your day when you get practice done in the morning. Uh, your thoughts on when you practiced at Alabama, it was in the dead of the heat at night, you know. What, when you first heard he was moving practice, what would you think? Well, it's a new era. You know what I mean? And we, we talked about this last show, man. It's like, I don't want to be the guy that's like, there's not multiple ways to do it. Um, it's a new era. And I, I think personally, I would have loved it. As a player, I would have loved it. Um, and in this era of transfer portal right now, it's hard to hold kids accountable, uh, accountable to the hard work, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just is what it is. I'm not saying that this generation's soft or anything like that. That's not the direction I want to go because I actually think it's kind of the opposite. Um, but when you look at what this era is and how quickly guys can leave or, you know, or be upset about different things, you know, if you're on, if you're, you know, if you're not having a great season in Alabama and you look at another program that is, and you, one of your boys is like, Hey man, we, we actually practice at 8 AM. It's not so hot outside or this, that, and the other. Yeah. I mean, you factor that in. So I don't know how much they're getting out of it football wise, Mick. I mean, I, I think that really it was a character builder having us practice in the heat of the day, you know, even. Those training camp practices, those famous training camp practices with Coach Saban in the heat of the day, it was tough, man. Uh, but it's different now. I, I actually, and somebody was talking too, and we can talk about this real quick. The Monday, uh, having the Monday off, practicing Sunday, man, that was a, I don't want to say this word because a lot of people get a little bit antsy about it. That's how we did it with Mike Shula, right? We practiced on <laughs> Sunday evening. Yeah. And then you had what was called a frosh practice where the freshmen uh, or the newcomers would that didn't play in the game uh, would get their reps and have kind of a scrimmage and we'd have Monday off. So, man, I don't know. It, it just uh, there's there's different ways to do it. Obviously, he's had success in those ways. I will say, and, and this is just to, to give you a bright side perspective. There were multiple times in the three years I spent with Nick Saban where I did get you know, four and five weeks into this run of games. And I would be like, I'm gassed. My legs are gassed. I distinctly remember going into, I think the 08 SEC championship thinking, dude, I'm, I, I feel gassed. I would cold tub every day, warm, cold, warm, cold, try to get my legs back up under me. But I think in terms of the length of the season now, when you look at how long it might take mm -hmm. you to get through the playoffs and, you know, an added game or two, I think it makes a lot of sense just to be able to keep these guys fresh. So, uh, morning practices, Mondays off. Hey, coach, being different. It's just a new era, dude. It's a new era. We got to get used to it. Yeah. Well, he was talking about last night too. Said that they've spent over 200 hours between practices, walkthroughs, meetings, lifts. He said they're grinding and they're ready to go. And and I just thought like you'd be a guy to ask about this. I mean, that seems like a lot of time together getting ready for one football game. There, there's no doubt about it, and, and I actually remember covering this in one of our captain's meetings. You know, we used to, have, we used to uh, Rolando, myself, and Javier, we used to meet with the team every Thursday. Um, speaking of which, that's another topic we need to get to. The captains have already been announced. Which Yeah, is let's do that next, yeah. Um, but, uh, look, we'd have those captain's meetings, and one time we ran through it, how many hours we had spent together, how much work we had put in. Um, we would even do leadership meetings and kind of talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the teams, uh, the Chattan UT Chattanoogas of the world, and, hey, man, this is how much we've put forward to this, and, you know, don't mm -hmm. let anything get lackadaisical. So it is, man. It's different. You have to be great at time management skills, but I think that that's one of those things that you learn in college, right? I mean, whether you're a regular student or not, you learn time management. Uh, you learn if you're going to stay up and, and hoot with the owls, you better wake up and soar with the eagles, as a, as a wise <laughs> man once said. And so uh, you learn that as you go, man, and, and, and you get used to it after a while. Yeah, no, I've heard that before. Um, 
And and I, that's something that just having worked with you in the past that I know you take a lot of pride in. Um, and I'm sure that's something that you learned from Nick Saban in Alabama football. But yeah. let's talk about these captains because you were one of them. This year's captains, easy picks, right? Jalen Milrow, Malachi Moore, Tyler Booker, and De- Deontay Lawson. And I feel like not only are these guys great football players and leaders, but they're also the guys that helped keep this program together. When, when coaches are leaving and they're trying to, you know, pull players to go with them and, you know, other coaching staffs are like camped out, as Nick Saban said, in the parking lot. This was – these guys deserve a lot of credit, not just because what they do on the football field, but because they get what Alabama means. I, I couldn't agree with you more on on each of those guys' character, man, because it, it does feel like when you look at each of those four, they, they are – they're almost – I don't want to say they're the last remaining bit of Nick Saban because they're not, but they have that mentality. And I think they're very important in this program that they kind of bridge the gap, right? They kind of bridge the gap between that Saban and DeBoer mentality. And they're the guys that can kind of carry it over. And let's be honest, if you can hit the ground and run with coach DeBoer and you can keep that mentality, that mentality only grows into the next generation and the next generation of players. And by that, I mean, 25, 26, 27, um, because they get used to a certain way of doing things and it doesn't kind of fall off. I think the the interesting thing to me is that we already know who the captains are. You and I have talked about this a number of times, and I've had a number of questions since they've been announced because Coach Saban did not do it that way. He didn't believe in doing it before the season, and his mm. answer always was, I don't want that to feel like other leaders on the team are excused from leadership because they're not captains, right? That was always Coach Saban's line of thinking is like, I want everybody to lead, and I especially want the seniors and the group leaders and position leaders to lead. I don't want them to look and go, well, I'm not a captain. It's not my problem. Um, so it's being done a little bit different under Coach DeBoer. However, with this group, I do like it. I, I, I think this group means a lot. I think when you look at, like you said, the four guys that are there, they're Alabama football right now, right? I mean, the fabric of that program kind of sits in their hands and they've come back and they've really kind of bled into this program and ushered in a new era. So I like the fact that we know who they are. It's definitely different. I am curious to see, you know, how that kind of changes the trajectory of the leadership council and other things that we enjoyed there. But um, like I said, different way of doing things. There's more than one way to do it. You can be successful in multiple ways. And uh, just another thing we'll get used to. Yeah, more than one way to skin a cat, as they say. A couple things, guys. I want to remind you that our show, uh, the All-American Report, is for subscribers to Cover Crimson. So make sure that you guys subscribe. Uh, I heard from some of our friends, and, and including the legendary Chris Bengal, that uh, there are going to be some new subscribers. You guys need to take advantage of uh, the subscription offer right now, and you can sign up for a dollar at uh, Cover Crimson. Dot com, But with that, you're going to get this show and other exclusive content. You get the message board. You get the, the stuff that they're they're posting there. Um, but after I think after this one, uh, it'll be something that you have to have a subscription. So please do it for us, man. We want to hang out with you guys every day. We want to talk some some uh, football with you. I also want to tell you that our channel is presented by mybookie.ag. Uh, use the promo code next round to double your initial deposit. That's right. My bookie will double your initial deposit when you use the code next round kick off the season with mybookie.ag and double your initial deposit by using the promo code next round all right mike i look behind you and this is a fun part i mean for all of the people that are going to be hanging out with us they're going to want to know what you got going on in your studio and what i notice is that there's a lot of trophies back there i also see a game ball so just pick a couple things and and tell me what they are. Uh, first of all, not a game ball. This, my friend, is a touchdown ball. Uh, really? Get that right. You know, I already know the deal. Uh, it says <laughs> it says one yard touchdown pass for Matt Ryan. That was in the Mercedes Benz Superdome at the time. Now they took their sponsorship and brought it to Atlanta, which we take a lot of pride in. Uh, that's November eleventh, twenty twelve. Caught a touchdown in the Superdome. I was on the field with Tony Gonzalez and Roddy White and Michael Turner and all these other people that are used to scoring touchdowns. And Matt Ryan was like, mm, no, this is it's Mike's Mike shot. Um, well, that's awesome. Do they does everybody that score a touchdown? Do you get one of those balls for every touchdown or is that because it was, you know, you're it's you're it's, not it's, see it's, a my, lot. it's my first career. Uh, it's my first career touchdown. So I think that's big. you know, it's funny, like 
I was so clocked in to what I needed to do next. I knew I needed to report eligible for the field goal team. Like I was the tight end on field goal. So I scored the touchdown, no power spike. I literally turned around. I'm like, what just happened? And of course, all the other <laughs> offensive linemen are like, that was awesome. Uh, and then I handed the ball to the referee and I go report eligible. And I'm like, hey, I'm eligible for this. We kick the field goal. And I go, oh my God, I'm going to want that football. Like, so I run back over and the referee's like, don't worry about it, man. We figured you probably wanted it. We handed it to the ball boy. He's got it back on the sideline. So there it is, man, right there in the flesh. It's actually got the the pink uh, breast cancer ribbon on it uh, as well. From that so game. is that so the actual – football? Well, sorry to interrupt. Is that the actual football and then they paint no, it over top of it? No, that, yeah, that's the one, and then they paint it over the top of it, just that one panel. So, Oh, man, that is so cool. I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's the actual one. That's um, the ball. That's the actual ball, dude. Got, got the big bear paws on it. So, so how many? Uh, uh, that was your first. Uh, how many career touchdowns did you have? Come on, man, that's not important. Uh, <laughs> <my> <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's not important. What do I got? All, right. All right, next. What else you got? What about the? Tr- okay, yeah, go. Keep going. Keep going. Well, I was gonna say this is uh, something my parents bought me. This is actually from a baseball game in high school. It's not me in the picture, but the headline is "Pine Force Prevails Behind Johnson Home Run." That was a playoff home run I hit when I was a senior in high school. I had a little ride about me going to Alabama, but right now, you know, I'm hitting home runs, hitting dingers. That obviously, that was in the uh, national championship, Tuscaloosa News. That's me and my boy Roy Upchurch. He just scored in 2000, 2008 against Tennessee up in Neyland Stadium. That was a 29 to 9 game. Mm-hmm. Um, Pensacola Amateur Athlete of the Year. Sweet. Um, what else? What about the trophy with the football on it right there? The, the two-time upfront award winner. You see the two circle ones. That's upfront award. That was a that was a lineman thing. Oh, this one right here. Yeah. This is the best one, dude. Let me see if y'all can zoom in on this. That right there. It says 2009 Offensive Player of the Year. Hold that up. Just keep holding. I'm going to put you a bigger screen here. Okay. You see that? It says 2009 yeah. Offensive Player of the Year. Now I don't know, Mick. I don't know if you can remember or not. <laughs> There's another pretty good offensive player on that team. I think we both won the award. I think we were co- co- <laughs> I'm not going to act like I was the only one. <laughs> Did he win a Heisman? Yeah, he might have had another couple <laughs> trophies as well. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Me and my man, Mark, uh, both won 2009 Offensive Player of the Year. And uh, that was, that's obviously anytime you can win an award alongside a Heisman winner, that's a pretty good one as well. So, mm-hmm. um, another couple of books, man. Got a. First edition Forrest Gump right there. Yeah, you don't want hey, to there you know go. about that, man. Look, um, I live in Fairhope, okay? That's where Winston Groom lived. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and that one down there is a Bart Starr Award for, I think, most improved player. That was right after Coach Saban was hired. That was the spring of 07. Um, nice. So, that's that one I kind of cherish a little bit, too. And Cool awards, man. I love all of them for uh, for all different reasons. I'm trying to, <clears throat> I see trying a to box. talk in the microphone. But. Hello, no, we can hear you. I, I see a box with some rings. Yeah, those are those are cool too. <laughs> Do you ever wear those out? Uh, no. To be honest with you, uh, and I'm planning on being at the at the Bama game and next weekend for for the Coach Saban field ceremony. Uh, I'm gonna get over there and check that out too. Even though I don't know if I can stay the whole game because I got to work the next day on Falcons Radio, but um, I might might break one out for that. Might might wear a <laughs> ring over that. That's uh, I'll be the only one without jewelry at that ceremony if I don't wear a ring to that. So yeah, man. No, it, it's all. All of it's good stuff. All of it's stuff I cherish, um, to be honest with you. And um, it's honestly pretty cool to be able to display it. So, man, it's uh, this this row right here is probably my favorite. Touchdown. Yeah, we were t- yeah there's some great stuff, man. Um, yeah. And you can tell I'm in a hotel room. So, I mean, like, think about the different <laughs> contract. But I do – look, I got my gray and my crimson behind me. Uh, yeah, let me ask works, you this, man. man. We kind of were talking about the All-Americans on this team. And – uh you know the, how important they were. Is what, what's it like getting to put your handprints in the concrete next to the stadium or next to Brian, uh, Denny Chimes? I tell people this all the time. There was a six month stretch of my life where I'm not sure that there's ever been a, a better six month stretch. Like you know how it is. Like, and I, I know there has around Alabama football players, but win the SC championship, win the national championship, played in the Senior Bowl, went to the combine. Um, obviously, we had the. Uh, it wasn't a parade, but a national championship celebration. I mean, everything. You know, you get drafted. Uh, you put your handprints in the, you know, at Denny Chimes. 
I guess, you know, sometimes when you reflect back on things like that, you don't realize how cool it was in the moment because you start hearing stories from other people. And my dad talked about not too long ago. He was telling me, he's like, dude, he's like, I got to ride in a police escort, which he never got to do. <laughs> and he was like, I, I literally was in an escorted car as a, as a family member on my way to Denny Chimes. They like stop, open up, you know, somebody opened up the door for me. I get out and like front row seat to the whole celebration. It was cool, man. And I, I can't tell you, I mean, the best part about it and the reason they do it is because every time somebody visits Denny Chimes that I might know or that, you know, listens to me doing things like this or on radio or, you know, anything. Um, I can't tell you how many pictures I have of friends, kids that have visited Denny Chimes and they see my name and they snap a picture and send it. Man, I get tweets like that. It's awesome, man. It never gets old to see those things because I see all the names around mine mm -hmm. and I realize what those names meant to me uh, and to Alabama football history. So it never gets old, man. That's one of the coolest things uh, that I had a chance to do was put the handprints in, the cleat prints. It's funny looking at all the different cleats over the years. You know, mine are like, you know, I got like, I'm not seven studs. Mine are like these long lineman cleats and, you know, Nike checks and things like that. But it was one of those real uh, surreal moments, rare moments that uh, not a lot of people get, man. So it's funny. I always think about the kids that are on a, you know, they're on a tour of Alabama, seeing if they want to mm -hmm. go there. I'm like, oh, this is all my name because uh, it's right there if you want to see. It. You were you were at Alabama when Nick Saban coached his first game, so you you transitioned from one coach to another. I feel like this one's a lot different just because it's not like one coach got fired and then you know you're replacing a staff. One coach retired. You keep a couple guys from the staff. If they would have kept more, had I think some of these coaches just kind of sat, you know, what, had been a little more patient. But I understand the business, man. You worry, you know, you might get an opportunity. What was it like that first game going from Shula to Saban? And then how do you think that translates into going from Saban to DeBoer when Alabama plays six o'clock on Saturday against Western Kentucky? Uh, honestly, it's hard to draw parallels because of the situations to be, to be real with you. And, and, and look, it was not just Nick Saban's first game. It was my first game as a starter. Um, mm -hmm. I actually, you know, went through training camp in a battle for the right tackle spot. Um, I'm not sure that I should, I, I probably wouldn't have won that battle on, on this, this day and ages teams. I was like, you know, 285 at the time and, uh, still trying to figure out what it meant to be a tackle and what it meant to be an offensive lineman. I think. Me and Chris Caps battled it out at right tackle, and I think a lot of people were ready for a change, and that was Andre Smith's freshman year as well. So it was my first game as a starter. It was definitely a different era around the program. Yeah. It was a lot of excitement. Um, but, look, I mean, we've talked about it before. When Nick Saban was hired, he comes in, and he's like, look, this is day number zero for everybody. This is a fresh start. Like, if you haven't put your best foot forward, now's the time. I don't know you, all right? All I will know is the work from here on, and, and I – I took that and ran with it. So I worked my butt off, win the training camp battle. It's my first start. I can't even remember who it was, to be honest with you. I want to say, I don't know, Western Carolina or maybe even Houston. Uh, I can't remember who it was that day that we that we faced off. Maybe Arkansas State. I'll look. But, at, I'll look it up while you're talking. Yeah, I mean, it, it just it was it was awesome, man. And 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 we had you know we were at full strength. You know, later on in 2007, the textbook uh, suspensions come around, but we we're at full strength for that game. And I think it was just, it was just different. You know, you get used to different game day, different stretches, different music playing, different everything. And obviously those guys have had a chance to do that through the month of August and get used Western to it. That's why you Carolina. do but yeah, Western Carolina, there you go. The catamounts. 52 uh, to six. I drive past there all the time. I'm away to Harris Cherokee casino. Uh, up there in North Carolina, <laughs> man. So, different story for a different day, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's just different. You get used to a different routine. I was I was less focused on Coach Saban and more focused on the fact that I was actually starting that day for the first time, which was a pretty surreal moment. So we've got a battle on the offensive line right now, uh, right tackle, Wilkin Formby and Eliza Pritchard. I, I definitely want you to keep an eye on those two guys or you know, yeah. kind of how that – off. I know you will, the offensive line in this first matchup. But take us through what it was like for you. Like you're going through this battle – to start, who were you up against? How does it go? And then how did they react when, you know, with them, you know, not, obviously not winning that job. And then you, you kind of held it for a long time, but I know you guys are close. I mean, you, even though you're glad you got the job, I'm sure you kind of felt like, Hey, I, you know, whoever this was, I, I'm really still pulling for them too. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, 
is a unique set of circumstance because Chris Caps, uh, oh who's yeah, from, who's from Georgia. Chris was, I think, a two-year starter at left tackle, um, and I kind of I came in at left tackle, but I weighed like two sixty-five. I was not ready for that. Mark Anderson used to destroy me every day uh, when I was a redshirt <laughs> freshman, um, and then I kind of I, I focused on really putting on a lot of weight before my redshirt freshman year, which was 06, uh, and kind of fitting in. And learning how to, so I play. I started playing guard because I thought, okay, guard's the place that I, you know, that I'll have some success. Both tackles were kind of taken, um, and so when Andre Smith was recruited, you kind of knew that Andre was pretty good. He's probably going to be the left tackle going into, uh, you know, going into those years. He's uh, he was, you know, oh six. He started every he started every game when he stepped on campus. Oh six, oh seven, oh eight. So you knew Andre would be part of that. So Chris Caps kind of flips over and, you know, they're going back and forth and doing a number of different things and going to 07. I started the the offseason at guard and uh, Coach Pendry, who was our offensive line coach, was like, I don't know how you fit into this, but just keep practicing as hard as you're practicing and keep working like you're working and we're going to find a place for you. Um, and eventually that ended up being battling at right tackle with Chris Caps. And as we moved throughout chain of camp, it was weird because you know, you have that moment in every training camp battle, Mick, where you don't want the other guy to mess up. But when they do, when the other guy messes up and it's like, Mike, get in there. Hey, Mike, get in there right now. You know, get the other guy, get out. You kind of step in and you're like, uh, this is a, this is a first string group. You know, this ain't yeah, right. not back here with some of the scrubs anymore. I'm not in the freshman practice. So being, being in there and, and getting next to the starters and understanding that that was – you know, John Parker at the time barking out signals and, uh, you know, I'm in there protecting him. It was like, man, this is different. So, you know, and obviously I had a good relationship with Chris Caps and, and, and thought the world of him, but wanted my uh, wanted my time to shine as well, man. It's just a unique circumstance uh, to be able to, to pull ahead in that battle and win. Yeah, and he he ended up playing a lot. I mean, you know, yeah. he had a great career at Alabama. Which, yeah. that's, and, and that's what I think about these two guys. I think if you don't win this, if you're – Pritchard or Formby, it doesn't mean that it's the end of the road. It just means that this particular battle wasn't won by you, but there's a in a snap of a finger, somebody could get hurt. I mean, you got hurt playing football. You know, a lot of guys have gotten hurt. So you you know that you always have to be ready for that opportunity when it presents itself. And then on top of it, that's a position where having someone that's that close to starting to be ready to start really helps the team. Yeah, Mick, and I mean – it's not just that one position. It's not just if the guy in front of you gets hurt. I mean, you, you we saw last year. I mean, uh, you know, Elijah Bridget played some left tackle. I thought he was pretty good, honestly, in, in a lot of those circumstances. So it's not just one guy. If anybody gets hurt, you would you would want to be the sixth man and the next man in. And honestly, I think it's important from a coaching staff perspective. And they've talked about playing multiple guys and rotating guys mm -hmm. in. And if they're both playing at a high level, they'll they'll both play. I think it is a unique circumstance. You don't have the the kickoff classic this year, you're not playing at a neutral yeah. field the way they have in the past. So, look, if it takes a week, it takes two weeks to see who you know, meshes better with the other guys on the field, then kind of so be it. I mean, you don't want to go into Washington that way, but – I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Wisconsin, not Washington. You don't want to go into Wisconsin that way, but look, I mean, if they're both playing at a high level, then then they both deserve the opportunity to be on the field, and you want them all to kind of uh, you know prepare like they're going to start that week. If you're like one of those utility linemen guys, how hard is it to keep up with what you're supposed to do? Because uh, having sat next to you for multiple football games, I realize that it's not just like like blocking the person in front of you. I mean, there's a lot more to this, but depending on where you are on that line, <laughs> like you're the guy that made me realize that I don't know crap about football. You know, <laughs> like well, I, and, and, and a lot look, of us don't. Not at the level that you know. Because explain that if you go in at the right tackle, right guard, you know, like whatever. How hard is it to to on a second, you know, know what you're supposed to do? So I'll be honest with you, it's all about knowing the scheme, right? Knowing the overall goal of what the offense is trying to do, and and you go from like when you get involved in an offense, and this is why it's important to me to be, you know, at one spot if you can and have the same coaches or at least the same scheme. Because as you go into that battle or as you go into a position, or let's just say you just showed up at college. I just showed up at Bama. I'm worried, like, am I going left or right? You know, like, is the play going that way or that way? Yeah. And then it goes to, like, do I block that guy or the linebacker, or do I go that way to block, you know, which direction am I going, a down lineman, a linebacker? And then it goes to, am I double teaming? And the older you get, 
And the more understanding you grow of that offense, and that comes by repetition, watching film, talking to other people, communicating, then you understand what you're trying to get accomplished, right? Then it's like, oh, we're trying to run zone. Um, Oh, you know, the center is responsible in a four down front for the Mike linebacker. We're going to call him zero. He's going to walk up. Hey, you know, 45 is the mic, 45 is the mic, and we're going to make ace and A and, and, and deuce calls, you know? So you begin to grow that understanding. Guys that are young, it's very hard to plug in and just say, you know, I haven't played this position or that position. But as you grow that understanding, and it's one of the reasons I started at four different spots in Alabama in my last two years, you grow the understanding and you start to understand this is what we're trying to get done. So mm-hmm. it got to a point when I was a senior, even if I had to play, you know, tight end, I could have been like, well, we're trying to push to the front side, Sam, leave the uncovered guy backside if we have to rotate away from it and, and, and allow the cutback lane to kind of take shape. I mean, that's just – it's a general understanding. So it is hard. The younger you are, the I mean, it is tenfold harder as a freshman to plug in and do that than it is at a junior and senior. And that's why you don't see it that often. And I think that's why you have guys like Caden Proctor might have struggled at times. You just don't get the overall understanding uh, uh, of the scheme at a young age. Uh, it's going to be the best group and the strength of this Alabama football team, and you and I are going to break it down yep. each week right here on the All-American Report. We want you guys to be a part of it, and again, I'm telling you, it's this is for subscribers. It's a subscriber show, so subscribe, man. That's all you got to do. Right now, if you do the annual subscription, boom, you get one of these. I'm going to give you some advice. Still Upsize. waiting on mine, by the way. You're, you're getting one. Upsize, though. Like I'm, I'm kind <laughs> of like large, extra-large guy, you know, in the middle. The large, the extra large fits perfectly. And I love right. it, man. This is a really comfortable shirt. It's got a good look to it. You guys get one with the annual subscription or just try it right now for a dollar and, uh, you know, and be part of our, our channel as well. And I want to remind you guys that, again, uh, take advantage of mybookie.ag and use the promo code next round to double your initial deposit. That's right. My bookie will double your initial deposit. When you use the code next round, kick off the football season with mybookie.ag and double your initial deposit by using the promo code next round. Mike, have a great weekend. We'll get back together next week and talk about an actual football game. I can't wait to hear all the stuff that you see out on the field because, guys, I'm telling you, man, this guy, this guy right here, over here, I got to point the other way. He, he's like, it, it's like a, a PhD of football knowledge. Yeah. Well, don't build me up too much, man. But trust me, there's <laughs> nothing I like better than watching <laughs> Alabama football and talking about what's going on, man. So that's uh, we're in, we're in the wheelhouse right now. Get your notepads ready for next week. Roll tight, everybody. <laughs> 